When I was growing up, my father always found a way to find a channel showing a classic western film, and I would get stuck watching it with him. I didn't grow my own appreciation for the western genre until adulthood, and to this day, I find myself stopping on any channel playing a western just like my dad would. I like a good western movie, because it's full of many themes that appeal to me. Good triumphing over evil, the hero getting the girl, justice prevailing. I like to see the bad guys having their way until the protagonist duels it out with them and sets things right. It's the age-old tale of someone finally standing up to the bully and winning. So when I watched Once Upon a Time in the West for the first time, I can honestly say I wasn't blown away. It was just so different from what I was used to in the John Ford Gregory Peck movies, where a badass like John Wayne isn't afraid to mouth off and get right to kicking a guy in the face. Those classic westerns are straight to the point and clean cut, with the characters as simple as black and white. It was only after I had seen a lot of other classic westerns, and eventually saw Once Upon a Time in the West again, that I fell in love with everything Sergio Leone had done in this movie. For starters, your classic westerns follow a simple formula of a crime being done, pursuit, and then justice. Occasionally, there's a damsel in distress to be won, or a petty feud about cattle and land, or the tried and true villainous tribe of Native Americans that are terrorizing the frontier. All of this and more usually happens at a steady pace, full of action and comedy and a constant inexorable path leading to a happy end. However, the pace of Once Upon a Time in the West doesn't follow this convention. Sure, it may include much of the same formula, but the path to get there is immediately different. The opening scene alone is eight minutes of pure waiting, and after three men are shot dead and a fourth left injured, we still barely have a clue about what's going on. This is a methodical movie. Sergio takes his time building to the inevitable climax of his film by providing subtle hints at the motives of the characters here and there throughout the film. It's not until after an hour and 55 minutes that we fully understand why the final duel is happening anyway. But is it worth the wait? Absolutely. Because Sergio Leone is in no rush to reveal all the secrets of the plot, he's allowed to take his time in telling a good story. He has time to create compelling characters with faults and dreams and choices to make that blur the lines of their traditionally black and white personalities. Of course, you have your protagonist played by Charles Bronson, but he's quiet, mysterious. He shows no real interest in the beautiful leading actress except to use her as a means for his revenge. He's not out to protect the town or conquer the West. He simply wants to kill a man, but will take his time doing it. He toys with his enemy psychologically and emotionally, tearing apart everything his nemesis has built until it's just the two of them, and only at the point of dying is their understanding of Harmonica's reason for vengeance. As for Frank, the main antagonist in this Western opera, he begins as the typical Western villain, dressed in black and a ruthless killer of men, women, and children. But his character takes a turn at embracing a new style of power by investing in land and using money to have his way, only to find himself betrayed by his gang, forced to accept that he can never be a part of the new society that's building its way across the West. But then there are the side characters who are no less complex. Everyone's favorite seems to be the charming, sarcastic, somewhat cantankerous Cheyenne. He's a bandit who's not above killing, but he and his men seem to live by a sense of honor that Frank and his gang lack. First off, Frank works at the behest of a train mogul named Mr. Morton, and he's sometimes halted in the midst of his bloodlust by Mr. Morton like a trained dog. Cheyenne, however, would never sell his services because his crimes are for his own selfish gangs and motives and he certainly lacks the nature to fall in line to the commands of another with presumed authority over him. That isn't to say he's out of control or a typical western rogue. In fact, he joins Harmonica in taking out Frank's gang and getting to the bottom of why a family was massacred in Sweetwater, going so far as to order his men to help build the skeletal framework of the town so a widow could keep her land and money. 
He's the hard ass with a heart of gold. Then there's Mr. Morton himself, who I believe is an underrated character. Initially, he's the representation of the corporate machine that's steamrolling over the western landscape with the railroad. He's the corrupt power with unlimited money and seems to fit into the classic trope of evil rich guy. But Leone gives us some twists. Mr. Morton is handicapped and seems forever confined to his trailer, which for all its glamour and richness seems no more than a fancy prison. Mr. Morton can only go so far as the train tracks and he must rely on others to do his bidding so that the railroad keeps moving on. You would think he wouldn't care who he killed to have his way, but Morton scolds Frank for his killings, showing he isn't exactly an all-consuming evil entity. His motives aren't just for profit either, as his ultimate dream is to reach the Pacific Ocean and look upon a new kind of vastness. It seems he would trade all of his riches for just one moment in the ocean, and his last scene shows only remorse at a dream unfulfilled. This is Western world building, with the symbolic railroad construction ever expanding in the background and the decline of the wild, untamable frontier, where men like Frank, Cheyenne, and Harmonica have become outdated and misplaced in the face of the new world. Besides giving us these great characters, Leone provides his film with some amazing cinematography. Aside from the opening scene, where there's a standoff between three against one. Take a look at one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie, when Frank and his men emerge from the natural background after just shooting down an entire family. You don't see any faces or details, just these shadowy figures in their long dusters flowing in the wind like capes. That's how you make an entrance. But I can honestly say this film wouldn't be the same without the incredible score from Ennio Morricone. He gave each character their own theme and found ways to blend in those themes with the overarching melody. Others describe the soundtrack as haunting, and that's exactly what it seems to do for the characters. Harmonica's plaintive wailing on his instrument sounds like an accusation from beyond the grave. Cheyenne's upbeat tune is wistful and playful with a hint of murder in the deeper notes that can be easily overlooked. Yet the one theme that made this entire soundtrack one of my favorites of all time is Frank's Death March theme that expands on his character's quieter, meditative theme with electric guitar and chorus. Here's a part of the final duel without that theme. Now here it is with it. Watch the timing of the music with the action. How Leone perfectly times the entrances of the characters with the guitar and the swelling theme as the scene expands, punctuated perfectly by Leone's patented close-up gaze on the actors' faces. This final showdown is filmed with a dramatic flair that outshines many of the classics, which were more about the ends and not about the means. Once more, Sergio takes his time to build a scene of tension and suspense between these two characters because he's shown us how dangerous Frank is, and he's certainly capable of coming out the winner. And that's the secret to enjoying this movie, understanding that it's going to take its time. So enjoy all the little details and unspoken things in between. This isn't a western of non-stop action and gunpowder, but of a slow build, a solemn homage to the classics that came before it. It's full of great one-liners and beautiful scenery. It could be a study in great film technique from lighting to storytelling. It definitely ranks among the best western films ever made, and that's why you should really watch Once Upon a Time in the West. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. What did you think of the movie? And if you have any suggestions on other movies we could do a video essay on, just let us know. We appreciate your support and give us a like and a sub. Thanks.